Welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here tonight, and supposedly it's our last cold day and supposed to warm up forever. Uh, of course, we know better than that. You know, we don't even know if it's going to warm up tomorrow. <laughs> you love the weather, man, but, you know, you just it's just hard to get it right these days. All right, uh, it seems to be there's some authority trumping the uh, weatherman's authority. So, but we'll look forward to the warm weather. Hey, tonight's show, of course, we like to talk about the courts. I got one, two, two court cases, uh, three legislative issues that are coming down uh, that I want you to know about. But we're going to spend a lot of time. There's a press conference on what was called cooperative private divorce. And what it would do would take divorce out of the courts. And if you are having an amicable, amicable divorce, things are going well, both of you got the way the, you want things, you don't have the cover or the shadow of the law influencing the decisions that you are making and trying to force on another party. If you're cooperating in your divorce, it allows you to not go to the courts where attorneys or a judge can really mess you over and make it a non-cooperative divorce. So, um, but that will always be an option. So there was a press conference yesterday down at the uh, state office building, Minnesota, um, where the House of Representatives uh, offices has their hearings. And um, so we're going to show that. I think you'll find it fascinating. Uh, I don't think there'll be any hearings this year, but it's a discussion that's been going on for a long time and the information. You, you want to watch this if you want to gain a perspective of what's going on and where the trend is in family law. But besides that, there are also, there's a hearing in the Senate tomorrow on a number of uh, family, family law bills relating to divorce and custody and child support. And these bills have already passed the House, and what's happening in the Senate, well, we got about 17 bills that are kind of being combined together, and they're hearing them one by one right now, but uh, eventually they'll probably all be joined together in one bill. Um, but that is, these bills came out of a committee, and I, I just got to tell you some of this, uh, what's going on, and next week hopefully we'll have the players some of the players involved in this movement on the show to explain some of the history. But from my, from my knowledge, um, you know, I was in the back room dealing when there was a bill passed two years ago that changed the presumption of parenting time from 25% to 35%. It's just a one number change. And there was a lot of hearings. And that thing went back and forth to a really good, solid presumption of joint physical custody bill to a, uh, in the House where the Senate just passed, changed one number, and in the end, all that got changed was that one number. And then Governor Dayton pocket vetoed uh, that bill. And, but he said, we're going to get all the parties together, 20 of these party groups, and when you get together, if you come out, any agreement, all 20 of you come to agreement with, we're going to pass. And these are, you know, it's basically a 10 and 10 groups that oppose each other, 10 on one side, 10 on another, that oppose each other. And this is what they've come up with is these bills. One of these groups, though, was the domestic violence group, the women's domestic violence group. And they ended up leaving. And instead of voicing their opinions as to why they liked something or didn't like something, they just left. We don't know why they left. We didn't know what they liked, what they didn't like. But they, for some reason, think they have either so much power or they didn't think it was worth their time that they backed away from the 20 group. All they had to do was be in that 20 group and say, no, we don't approve of this. But instead what's happening is they went away from the table and now they're going behind the scenes, the women's domestic group, violence groups, and they're sabotaging the, these bills. However, they're, they're not going to be able to do it. Um, so I think a dynamic change has taken place in our legislature. Um, and, uh, and in the executive branch, 
where they finally have figured out that the domestic violence group, the women's domestic violence group, has themselves gained so much power that they are becoming violent themselves. In other words, they're not staying at the table, they're not um, uh, communicating in the dialogue, they are being bullies and saying, you know, just trying to sabotage then to work cooperatively with uh, uh, other players uh, and trying to understand the real issues. So they are not helping their cause, um, in my opinion. I, I, and I think the legislature as a whole has gotten it. Those that are on the abusive side of the women's domestic violence movement are somewhat in a quandary here because they realize that these players are not playing fair. Um, let me state emphatically that I am against women being abused and children and men. And this is not speaking against uh, having programs that help women who are being abused. We, we need those. I'd rather see it in the private industry rather than the government, but we also need it with men and we need a fair playing field, but the domestic violence industry isn't playing fair and they see themselves losing power through these bills and so instead of cooperating and being part of the 100% agreement or saying, no, I don't like this, and then we either don't address that issue or move away, they're saying, we're leaving the table. Uh, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs for them, um, and I don't want them to lose their voice. Uh, uh, I don't mind if they lose some of their power because they're so unrealistic, and they're now at the position where they are encouraging false testimony in courts and um, uh, using, and just think they can say whatever and get away with it. And fortunately, that is not happening. So uh, in the family law bills, a hearing in the Senate tomorrow, that will be a big aspect. And then these bills will start the final process of being passed and then given over to the governor. We'll see what he will do with them. Um, a couple other, uh, well, I brought to your attention last week that, and for many weeks, about the issue of oath of office and judges taking their oath of office. And I've been talking with my representative and other representatives about getting a bill to deal with this. First of all, I want this judge who did not sign her oath of office or give an oath of office to be gone. Our law says she vacated her office. And what the what I'm getting back, at least from the House research, is that there's just nothing there. Although I read it in law and, and understand it, they're saying there's nothing on oath of office for judges, even though the U.S. Constitution says they have to swear one and give one. Um, <clears throat> and the law says a vac vacancy of any office. So uh, you vacated the office if you didn't swear an oath. They're saying there's just nothing there on judges. So what is right now in the process is they are putting in a penalty that a, we're looking at the possibility of passing a law that puts in a penalty that if a judge does not sign their oath of office, they don't get paid. Okay, so what happens if you have a wealthy judge, doesn't swear the oath of office, they just want to be there for the power, and they can go on and on. So we got things to work out here. I personally think it should be you're, out, you're done. If you haven't signed your oath of office by the time you've done your first act, you should be done. Now, with a qualifier here, and I think it's important, mistake happens, mistakes happen. Secretaries of State can lose information or it can be taken away or removed. We find judges do that in court cases. They remove transcripts and change transcripts and remove evidence. So it could happen at the executive branch side too where a judge did fill out an oath of office, did send it in, and the Secretary of State's office somehow loses it. Um, so there should be some protections in there, uh, but it's just something that's really, really hard not to do.
to, to not have that secure, not have that oath done and have it properly recorded. So understanding that, the current law says uh, it doesn't matter whether you intentionally or unintentionally didn't do your oath of office, you're done. So anyway, there's some movement on that. They're looking at that. Um, maybe too late to have a hearing this year. Uh, maybe get thrown into a, a, a bill as an amendment that's already gone through that's a similar subject. There's so many ways to get around the deadlines. Uh, but this is pretty, you know, for a worst case scenario, as this is a, a solution, uh, yeah, I, I'll go with it. This is as far as something happening and making sure that these judges sign and give their oath of office. Uh, so that's moving on now. Uh, two cases that I want to bring you up to date on. One I thought was very interesting. I was in a courtroom in Wright County today before Judge Elizabeth Strand. I wasn't before. Somebody else was. But somebody was challenging. They had a debt, couldn't pay it. Uh, basically, the reason they couldn't pay it was because of all the uh, fraudulent, in their, in their mind, fraudulent court cases that had been brought against them. And... Uh, when those court cases were brought against them, they they just became financially insolvent. And so a credit card company was coming after them. So this individual thought that, uh, well, let's, let's check this out. Let's see if fractional reserve banking is constitutional. And so he pro he, this person brought a defense that said, look, the credit card company, due to fractional reserve banking, created uh, this uh, money out of thin air. So one of the aspects to have a proper loan is you have to have consideration. And so in, in fractional reserve banking, money's created out of thin air. It's just digits. Uh, he's saying there was no consideration given. You just told me, Here's, we're making this up, and there you go. And then because people are acting on it, it, it's, it, it works for some reason. And he's saying, no, there was no consideration. I don't owe you this money back. And there's a couple of other reasons there. But this is a challenge, and there's other court cases that uh, actually defend his position that the fractional reserve banking system is unconstitutional, and there's already been a corporation uh, that has had their uh, one, uh, or was ruled illegal because it had the same type of corporation financing as the Federal Reserve, and that was ruled unconstitutional. So, interesting. Uh, I think the judge was uh, um, had her hands full, uh, a lot going on there, and uh, definitely the bailiff was, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> you know, I'm sure he didn't expect to hear that this morning. All right, another issue that came up and that's going on in the courts is Michelle McDonald um, had a client uh, who's been on the show, uh, Sandra Grazzini Rucky, and uh, Sandra paid some attorneys a lot of money. Um, uh, according to the court papers, 125000 retainer for one, 80000 for another, and then $500 for another uh, retainer. And basically, she got no help. I mean, they got some motions drawn up and stuff like that, but nowhere near $125,000 or $80,000 worth. And so Michelle McDonald, who run for the Minnesota Supreme Court, asked these attorneys to justify their billing. Show your billing. Show the work that you did. Get a, I mean, and, and for the time that they worked, they collect, they kept the whole retainer. But when I was reading through the case, they didn't do any, they hardly did anything. I mean, and then one of the attorneys, the day of her court case, or the second day for her court case, her attorney said, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm done. You know, paying $80,000 and then you're done all of a sudden. Uh, pay me more or we're out of here. You know, I, un unbelievable. So with this... Uh, aspect going on in this court case and of course the judge arrested um, Michelle McDonald or had the Michelle McDonald arrested under an oral warrant which is illegal. Uh, 
uh, Michelle McDonald had to defend Sandra Grazzini Rucky in a civil case in handcuffs without her shoes, without her glasses, without her court papers, without her client, and the judge wouldn't postpone the hearing for another day. Unbelievable behavior by Judge David Knutson in Dakota County. And, uh, but this is the way Sandra Grazzini Rucky was being treated during this whole process. And, and her attorney. Can you imagine, have you ever heard of an attorney practicing before a judge in handcuffs? You know, in a wheelchair? What, you know, and <laughs> unbelievable. But this type of thing was going on. Well, so Michelle McDonald said, hey, uh, attorneys, justify your fees. And so she subpoenaed the attorneys, and which is a proper legal move to do. And the court came back at her, and the attorneys came back at, her, at Michelle McDonald and said, hey, court, uh, drop this uh, issue. Don't let us show and justify our fees because there's an easier way to do it. You don't have to subpoena us, okay? All you have to do is go and ask us for our records. Well, here's the deal. That's not how it happens because there's no attorney that's just going to give over their fees. And so if there's an easier way to get the information, the court is saying, the district court said, if there's an easier way to get the information from these attorneys, do the easier way. But see, what they did is they put Michelle McDonald in a, in a win-lose situation. So if she would have done the easier way, the courts would have said, well, you should have subpoenaed the documents. And if she subpoenas the document, the court's just saying you should have done it in an easier way. So she can't win on this issue. And the courts are, in this case, the district court is making up rules and regulations that are not even in the rules of practice. And so it's just bizarre, beyond bizarre. And this is, again, part of the targeting of Michelle McDonald for, for one, suing a judge in federal court, uh, David Knudsen, for his behavior in the courtroom and then also uh, for running for against a sitting judge for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, so the uh, gloves are off, the battle's being uh, fought, which reminds me on the next Tuesday uh, at 10 o'clock down at the St. Paul Federal Court, there is non-oral arguments before the Eighth Circuit Appellate Court on the issue of David Knutson's behavior in the courtroom and treatment of Sandra Grazzini Rucky and Michelle McDonald. Michelle sued in federal court. It's interesting, this was scheduled for an oral argument, and then last week they changed it to non-oral. I don't know why, I'm going to call, I haven't had time, I'm going to call the clerk down at the uh, federal appellate court and find out how, what determines whether there's an oral argument, a non-oral argument. It is really bizarre that it's going to be a non-oral argument. Um, I don't get it. And so it's all done in secret because you don't get to see the non-oral arguments. All you get to do is read the writings so you don't know what the discussion was that went on. So it's a private uh, backroom deal, even though she has representation of some high, very high qualified lawyers uh, uh, defending her and uh, going after David Knudsen for uh, what he did in Dakota County, Judge David Knudsen. All right, um, so a lot going on. <laughs> That's kind of a summary of, of what's taken place here in the last week and what's coming up this week. Uh, but I want you to know hear about this press conference about cooperative private divorce. And so we're going to start the press conference off. And again, the whole issue of cooperative private divorce is to get the courts out of the divorce system, uh, which ends up usually causing very much, much turmoil and trouble, uh, but doesn't get rid of the courts for divorce. So um, this is uh, John Lesh is going to start us out explaining what this whole bill is about. So let's play the clip. Hi, thank you everyone for coming. My name is State Representative John Lesh. I represent District 66B in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, and we're here to talk about cooperative private divorce. Cooperative private divorce is an alternative path uh, to couples who find themselves in the unfortunate situation 
um, of coming to the end of their marriage. Uh, this system um, is the result of a current, uh, this proposal is the result of a current system that in, encourages couples to become opponents in a win-lose contest with high stakes. Uh, and of course, it's not just the children uh, who pay the cost of this, but also the, uh, the partners themselves who in the long uh, run uh, end up having to do years of work to repair uh, what uh, was a broken relationship, um, but which they need to use to uh, cooperatively raise a child and become good examples for their kids um, so that their kids can, can have healthy, productive lives as well. The result is a toxic uh, situation for everyone involved and also becomes incredibly expensive. Um, I can use my own uh, situation. I, I was uh, divorced uh, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, which was hands down the saddest time in my life. Uh, and um, my, my wife and I at the time, who had been married for 10 years and had a uh, a one-year-old child, um, we uh, went through all the hardship together over a couple of years and came to the result that we were going to get divorced and really worked together to achieve a good result for our daughter. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> then we had to enter the court system to do this, and everything broke down. Uh, and in the worst parts of our lives together, um, it became very difficult to manage that plan that we had developed for ourselves uh, and for our daughter. Uh, and it took years to repair that. I'm very happy and lucky to say that um, uh, my ex-wife and I have an excellent relationship. She is one of my closest friends. Um, I got married a couple years ago, and she did a reading at, at the wedding, uh, which you don't see too much. Uh, but, uh, but that's because we're, we're very close. We jointly raise our daughter, and she's, she's very important to me. Um, but the system that we had to go through in order to get diver divorced and preserve a good environment for our child to be raised in jointly, that system almost destroyed it all. Uh, and, I, and I became frustrated at it uh, 10 years ago and thought there has to be a better way uh, rather than doing this. Um, and the result is uh, this system that these individuals uh, behind me uh, have worked on um, that I'm be carrying this bill in the House. Senator Sandy Pappas is carrying in the Senate. Um, and are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Doing very important things in the Senate. Um, so this gives people an op a, a chance to opt out of the current winner-take-all, win-lose system that provides that toxic uh, environment for our kids. So the key ingredient here that people file together they work out the agreements uh, without, uh, with whatever help they need from professionals um, and then file their agreements with no need to have court review or approval. Um, so with that, I would introduce uh, Senator Sandy Pappas. All right. Uh, you know, here's what's happening in the breakdown in the legislature. Um, because of all the work that me and a number of other people have done down there, uh, and you see a number of them in the background there that have spent years working on changing the family law system to be fairer and better in trying to strengthen families. Um, Democrats uh, and Republicans who have gone through a divorce understand what the court is about. And so this is becoming a very nonpartisan issue. And in the House, we've had uh, great support from both parties, the liberal, anti-family, women's domestic violence group uh, at all costs, women are the best superior to men group, they're, they're against it, but it's a small minority. Now on the Senate side, you have uh, the Republicans who haven't been to a divorce and don't want to know what's going on and don't want to be engaged in this conversation. And even the Democrats that are in the same situation, there's just a different mentality there, yet it is, has gained momentum because of what's going on in the House. And then some people, and even Sandy uh, Pappas, who is considered very liberal, has been uh, stepping up and protecting families, trying to protect families in the divorce arena. So. Um, 
uh, because they've been through the process and they understand it and they can't be bamboozled by some divorce attorney uh, coming up and, you know, basically lying to their face. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not going to be bamboozled. So we see this, you know, over the years I've seen this diagram, dialogue and dynamic change in the Senate. Okay, um, before we go to the next clip, I want to remind you, if you've got comments or questions, 651-747-3838. We do have a lot of film clips here. Um, so let's uh, hear what Sandy Pappas has to uh, say about this bill. So sorry to be late. I thought this was at 10 o'clock. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the product of a divorce, and uh, um, I firmly believe that my parents' divorce uh, without lawyers could have been handled in a much more cooperative way that would have been more um, helpful for our family in healing and continuing with, um, with our lives. My mother was a very strong woman, so even back then she was a stay-at-home mom, but she wasn't going to let anyone take advantage of her. And I think she would have been able to stand up for her rights. And unfortunately, in many situations, we don't allow the uh, couples to cooperate, um, even though they can cooperate in marriage and decide to get married without a judge, to cooperate in the process of dissolving their relationship. And well, I think it's very, very important to protect the few that need protection, um, battered women in particular, uh, or who are victims of emotional and physical abuse um, at the hands of their spouse. Um, I don't think we should hold all couples hostage for that. So my desire and my goal with this legislation is to um, allow a more cooperative ap atmosphere, to allow um, divorced um, courtesy, you know, putting the kids first, like the columnist talks about, um, while still being sure that those who do need the protection of the courts have that protection. Um, thank you. And I'll turn it over to the Bill Doherty. All right. All right, uh, my name. All right, this, um, you know, again, Sandy Pappas just reiterates what John Lesh reiterated. The personal experience of seeing what really happens is, is what's driving this. And, and people being more and more eloquent to describe what's taking place in the courtrooms. And basically the corruption of the courtrooms is because the legislature starting to pay attention to this and saying, hey, let's provide some more checks and balances and, and give people more power over their lives than a government agency, um, which raises, can raise some problems. And we're going to hear some of these in the question and answers. But let's listen to Bill Doherty, professor of family social science at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's kind of been one of the ringleaders I want to describe it that way. There's just a lot of engagement here, but he's kind of been the moderator of this group. So let's hear what he has to say. My name is Bill Doherty. I'm a professor of family social science at the University of Minnesota, direct the Minnesota Couples on the Brink Project. I'm a long-term marriage and family therapist. I've worked with many couples both to heal their marriages and also to constructively end them. And I'm surrounded by, uh, by folks who have been uh, working, have been working with, with me and, and others uh, to put together a cooperative private divorce, which is two things. It's both a logical extension of important work that has gone on, including in the state of Minnesota, to try to take the fight out of divorce and make it more collaborative and cooperative. Our state has been in the lead in this. So it's a logical extension. It's also a radical reform. Uh, my, my reading about the history of divorce reform suggests that this is the biggest change we're proposing uh, since uh, no-fault divorce uh, came along uh, 45 years ago. Um, uh, the current placement of divorce only within the court, with divorce being a court order, is an artifact of history in which a divorce was only awarded because somebody was at fault. Somebody messed up, and then you needed either a church court or later on a, a civil court to determine who was at fault and then who deserved to get a divorce. Uh, we have moved past that day, and we are in the no-fault divor divorce era, but we still put all uh, divorces through the court system. If you're ending a business, 
You can decide to end the business and form your own contract to end the business. You don't have to get a court order to end your business. So we have then an artifact system of history that we think should only be, should be available, will be available under the system uh, for people who need that. But we are creating a cooperative private divorce track outside of the courts, administered through a separate state agency as a voluntary alternative, as a voluntary alternative to court-based divorce. It briefly begins with an, this would all be online, an online orientation that describes who this is for, and it's for people who believe they can cooperate and trust each other. As, Rep as uh, uh, Senator Pappas said, it's not for folks who feel that they could be taken advantage of in this system. Uh, they submit, the spouses submit an intent to divorce form to the state agency. All the records are kept private. They may then choose to uh, hire advocates, advisors, uh, anybody who they can help them, just like we hire tax advisors. Anybody can help them in this process, which for some people is, of course, quite complex. And they then develop their own agreements in their own language that makes sense to them, again, using any help that, that, they, that they choose to do to take advantage of. They form their own agreements in their own language, and after a 90-day waiting period, they submit those agreements, and these agreements then uh, become their divorce agreement, which then become a, 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 their own contract, which could be enforced by the court later on. Um, and there is no, the key thing in this is there is no judge at the end of the day saying, this is okay or this is not okay. So it takes place completely outside of the courts, just as you would say in ending a private business. No third party review, judicial, judicial approval. Then they receive a certificate of divorce. They can go back in and in the future anytime they want and retrieve their documents and modify them at their own discretion. They can choose how much detail to put in and how much to let for the future. So it is, it is up to them and their advisors how they do this, as opposed to the current system where ultimately, ultimately, since it takes place in the court, then a judge has to agree uh, on and has to sign off on that court order that they, they are divorced. So that those are the elements of it. And I want to uh, emphasize there's two things. There's the various technical aspects of this that we've consulted far and wide and will continue to be attuned and improved. And there's also this cultural level that we really heard from our our representatives here, that we're one, we want to have an alternative to the court-based system in order to say to the public, to one another, that, that divorce does not have to be a contest where two people uh, hire separate agents of their own individual interest uh, so, and ultimately f either fight it out in court or avoid court but still do a battle and a contest. So this can be cooperative, this can be private. So that's the kind of cultural change we're interested in as well as the legal change. So that's the overview. And we're going to hear briefly now from two people who are going to tell us about their own experience. And the first is uh, Susan Carpenter. All right, so uh, Bill Doherty laid out what it's about and the details. And I'm going to remind you uh, in a couple days, you can go to youtube.com, Speechless Minnesota, and search cooperative private divorce, and you will uh, be able to go back and replay this press conference and, and the show and get more of those details. But I think he laid out a very fascinating history of the divorce process uh, and the history of it, simplified but very accurate to where it has this is coming to today. It is not making divorce easier. It's not making it simpler. It's making it more cooperative in, in eliminating the damage that the way our divorce system works today is, is, is causing so much damage to children and, and to parents and basically to our state and to our nation. So this is hopefully reduces some of the damage the way our current system is run. All right, let's hear what Susan Carpenter has to say. Hi. <clears throat> oh, sure. Yep, is that good? Okay. Um, my name is Susan Carpenter, and it's S-U-S-A-N 
C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E-R. And I went through a lengthy divorce process, and I'm now a mediator and a conflict coach. And when my husband and I decided to divorce, we sat down privately and discussed how best to move forward. We had agreements on custody, parenting time, child support, our debts, and the house. And we were both very relieved. Once attorneys got involved, my husband was advised not to pay any bills or child support until court ordered to do so. And my lawyer's response was uh, not to agree to a parenting time plan uh, without a court order either. Um, eight years of hostility followed. Motions, hearings, court orders, custody, all the legal terms are very scary things. And so you listen to your lawyer. And it's easy to forget about doing the right thing. Um, the right thing to do comes from your heart and not laws when it comes to your children. I've been involved with cooperative private divorce because I don't believe people should have to sue each other to end their marriage. I don't believe that families belong in court. I've seen the court system bring out the worst in people um, in my own divorce and also for my clients. Current divorce is an adversarial process. Lawyers don't always fight for what their clients need but rather uh, what they believe a judge will award. Court dates and deadlines push people into decisions that they're not always ready to make. And if played to a judge, everything goes negative. Your opponent has to look bad so you look good. Parents can get stuck in negative thinking and start to see only the bad in the other parent. This all leads to unworkable court orders that people never wanted in the first place. Communication shuts down because everything you say is used against you. That is a horrible start for parents who have to share their children after divorce. I believe it's time to move people out of the negative spiral of court divorce and allow them to divorce in a more positive way with the help of people they choose. Maybe a pastor, financial planner, a mediator, and they may choose to hire lawyers but skip the deadlines and court dates that come with that. People should have the freedom to choose. My family did get out of the court system, and once we did, parenting time was very flexible and financial matters were handled realistically. We learned to work cooperatively only after the court was gone. My former spouse and I are not good friends, but the fighting stopped and we know when to communicate about the children. Cooperative private divorce will change the way the public and the legal community think about divorce and take private family matters in a new direction outside of the courtroom. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Susan. So one of the uh, players in the divorce industry is Mike uh, Ditburner. Uh, he's with the a divorce lawyer and with the uh, uh, Minnesota State Bar Association and the American Association of Matrimonial Lawyers and he is not in favor of this and my personal opinion and after knowing him and seeing him and uh, over the years is the reason is is because it takes lawyers out of the game and you know with Susan Carpenter you know eight years of service and fees for services and just being forced in this antagonism uh, that's going on that took place there and and who won the lawyers you know that's the bottom line of what's taking place here and so the biggest people that are going to oppose this are going to be the lawyers and I don't think the judges will mind. <laughs> I think the judges will like this because they don't like dealing with divorces, except for the fact that they understand that this is a big financial industry for the lawyers. Okay, uh, let's hear the next uh, speaker, Vicki Hill. Ricky. And uh, so we'll also hear briefly from Vicki Hill. Ricky. So it's V I C K I, I'll save you this H I L L and R I C K E Y. Good morning. I was in an unhappy marriage and I hired an attorney. Therefore, my husband had to hire an attorney. So unhappy went from unhappy to adversarial, to ugly, to feeling like I was a caged animal in a, a wolf in a cage that I couldn't find my way out of. The attorney that I hired was not respectful. 
he did not he did not feel that um, he took all control all decision making power away from me he wanted to do everything his way and I felt disrespected I felt as though I didn't matter and I would walk to the mailbox and there would be a bill every month for five thousand dollars well finally I realized I could not afford to keep on paying five thousand dollars a month in attorney fees so I just didn't contact the attorney any longer about two months later I received a letter in the mail from the firm and they dropped my case uh, mainly because there hadn't been any action and we couldn't agree on we couldn't agree on anything so I was at ground zero I needed to start over I did some research and I landed at Erickson mediation a mediation uh, practice that has been doing mediation for 38 years in the Twin Cities area the feeling that I had the day that I walked into Erickson Mediation was very different than how I felt at a downtown law firm. I walked in, I felt it calming, I felt respected, I felt like I mattered. At no point in the, I think, 13 months mediation process was I ever looked none of my ideas were ever looked down upon any little idea that I had we would talk about we would mutually agree on how to parent how to do insurance how to divide assets I had a rather complicated divorce and it took some out-of-the-box thinking as well as creative thinking in order to come up with a way to uh, to reach a mutually accepted agreement. Um, I need to just finish up here with saying that I truly believe in cooperative private divorce. It provides unhappy couples with an option to use a friendly creative process to prevent adversarial futures. You decrease the amount of money that you are going to spend on a, di on a divorce. You dec decrease the family discord and you have the chance of being a friend with your spouse after the divorce is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well said. Well, you see the financial aspect came into play. All right, at this point, uh, I believe a lot of questions from the press came in. So we're going to just play this. We only got about 13 minutes left, so we're going to play the rest of without an eruption, uh, maybe. But we're just going to let the questions go. All right, uh, show the rest. Okay. So now we have time for questions, um, and we'll I'll decide who's going to field them. Yes. Um, what's the opposition to this? What's the downside of this? Uh, well, uh, there's a there's a couple of concerns that have been raised. Uh, one is that if you don't ultimately have a judge reviewing decisions, that uh, people might make. Uh, agreements that are confusing, vague, that they could regret. Um, uh, a second is, uh, what about people, particularly women, who might get talked into doing the uh, cooperative private divorce route and it's not in their best interest? And we have responses to those, uh, but those are, those are two ones that have been raised. And that's, that's what I would like to hear. I mean, isn't the purpose of requiring a judge's sign out to make sure that no one is taken advantage of? I mean, are the courts really the problem here? It would seem that sort of adversarial attorneys fighting is the problem more than the actual system itself. Well, in our view, and others may want to comment, uh, when, we, when, we, when we put divorce in the court, we are, it's, it's like when you, uh, when you criminalize marijuana, it's in the criminal justice system. Okay, So a lot flows from that. So once we say that a, uh, that a divorce takes a court order signed by a judge, then we are now in a system where experts in adversarial work uh, are, going to, are, are going to hold sway. Uh, the judges also are looking at whether people are following the particular rules and norms and standards of the family law. So a lot of people do what's called pro se or they, they, they file on their own and uh, they often get, they may get feedback that they didn't dot all the I's and cross all the T's and so then people are going to want to hire somebody who knows the rules of that system. And courts are inherently an adversarial system. That's how we set up. You have, you have two people who are in, in, in a, a legal action 
uh, and a judge is supposed to arbitrate that. So we think that the adversarial nature is baked into is baked into court-based divorce. And you know, I can say this to Abby. The one thing, if if I was uh, if I was going to oppose this bill, uh, speaking as a devil's advocate, I would say. The one thing that forcing this into an adversarial arena like the courts does is it screens all of the cases. There's no question we all agree. There is, there's a certain percentage of dissolutions that, that have to go through the courts, absolutely. And what the current system does is it screens all of them and forces all of them through a certain number of hoops to ensure that um, it's not, it is or isn't one of those cases that must be dealt with by attorneys engaging in adversarial taxes and, and uh, tactics and judges ultimately uh, uh, being the arbitrator on that. So uh, the preliminary forum would sort of gauge whether this can be done in or out of the courts? That's correct. Okay. And there is always the option, too. So I'll use my example. We had to go through the adversarial system. Um, it took a lot of work to maintain it cooperatively. There are still some things that I, having ultimately um, despite the system engaged in a cooperative process, it made it much more difficult for me. But there are still some uh, regrets that I have. I wish I could have honestly gotten a little bit more time with my daughter, okay? But, but in, the, in retrospect, um, I'm not challenging that because I cooperated with my ex-wife to get that, uh, and it's very important to her. And my, my ongoing relationship with, with my ex-wife uh, and how I demonstrate that to my daughter is more important to me than nitpicking around the edges. If you have a judge come down, if you have lawyers fighting over it, uh, and then a judge will come down and renders a decision, you're always going to be bucking that decision. If it's cooperative, that agreement lasts much longer. Even if it does sort of fit the threshold to go through this cooperative course, is there a final sign-off to, to make sure everything's on the up and up? And, and isn't that disconcerting? So if you have a final sign-off, it's a court-based divorce. Uh, and so it, you, it, you can have it both ways. Because uh, if the judge ultimately then it becomes a court order, um, uh, or it, it's meaningless. In other words, if it's just a routine sign-off. But if you get the agreement, like Abby's saying, say you do the process of not in court, but then one person doesn't hold up their end. It it's all enforceable. These agreements are all enforceable by a court. Okay, it's just that the judge doesn't sign off before it. So if it you, doesn't go through a court, but it's bind, bound. All, it's all binding. Okay. It's all binding. Now, on the question of, of women who, uh, or anybody, but particularly women who might be talked into this process, would any of my colleagues like to respond? Uh, I'm happy to as well, but I want to share, share that if anybody would like to. Yeah. Um, you know, as I was saying, a lot of attorneys... Uh, not all, but some of them look at it as, oh, what's a judge going to approve? And, um, you know, there's not specific laws for families, like what time should bedtime be or, or these kind of things, especially parenting plans. I'm not sure why. So, so this is a question about women. So, right. right. And um, so if you get an attorney, they sometimes talk you into things, too, that aren't in your best interest. So I, there, I think there's that... Um, <coughs> in the current system, but I know people who go through cooperative pro processes like mediation finally get a chance to be heard. They get to express their ideas, and then once they know someone's listening, they, they usually are more empowered. A lot of those processes are more empowering to uh, women and men in general. I'd like to say something. I'd like to say that uh, I was in a very difficult divorce where the husband could outspend me and that w that was a problem as a woman because I felt like someone from the Middle East who no matter how hard I tried without mediation I could not get out because he could pay ten thousand bills what ten thousand dollars a month to try to sue me where I could only pay two thousand dollars a month and there was no way financially I could get out from under this divorce without mediation. Um, oh, go ahead. Did somebody else want to talk? I just wanted to address. So yourself, yeah. uh, I'm Marilyn McKnight from Erickson Mediation, and I wanted to address the issue of um, the judge sign off just briefly, and that is that um, when uh, I 
got this group together two and a half years ago, what I was seeing in my clients who were mediating their divorces, and most of them unrepresented by choice, um, they would get to the final agreement and then they would say, well, why do we have to go to court? This is, we know what we're going to do, and we have it all put together here. It's spelled out in a lot of detail. Why does the judge have to look at that? And is the judge going to somehow tell us we're wrong? Um, and, and frankly, judges don't tell people they're wrong. In fact, judges, uh, it's a question as to the extent that they even review divorces. But, but then they raise that question, why, why do we have to even go into a court? And, and that's partly the impetus for even starting all of this. John, let me ask you this, or, or anyone out there. Um, I, I perceive hearing some criticism um, along one track that divorce is already too prevalent in society right now, and this will make it easier for people to get a divorce. Uh, anyone who's ever been through a divorce uh, cannot imagine how this would make it more likely that people would get divorced. Um, I, I just cannot imagine that. It is a, a horrible horrible process to have to go through to end a relationship like that. Um, so uh, I can see how someone could su suggest uh, procedurally you could make that, that argument, uh, but I just, I'm just hard, I'm hard pressed to, you know, over half of marriages end a divorce, you know, I, I think that's unfortunate because uh, that, that is too many. I, 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 wish, I wish that, you know, people would stay together longer, absolutely. Um, what, what this bill does uh, has nothing to do with the likelihood of whether or not people that find themselves in that situation are going to follow through, what it does is try to find some way that when that does happen, that at least their kids can grow up in an environment where they see mom and dad can agree on something, and, and maybe they have less of a chance to find themselves in the bad situation when they're adults. I hope, I hope that's what it achieves. And I would add to that that you know, some of my career is based on preventing unnecessary divorces. Uh, and I believe, and it's been part of the discussions of this group, that, that some divorces may be prevented because people do not immediately get into the hostile adversarial relationships. My own research in Hennepin County showed there's a lot of ambivalence among people who file for divorce about whether to go ahead. But they get caught up in a system where somebody who you're not getting along with now becomes an enemy. So my belief is that this actually may preserve some marriages that, that could be preserved. Dr. Doherty, a couple questions for you. I, I th all right, I just wanted to touch this one issue, and, and, I, and I think it's a, a, a very good point that uh, somebody has uh, mentioned. Uh, what increases divorce is societal acceptance and lack of personal commitment. And as long as those things increase, so will the divorce rate. It's not the ease of courts. It's not the ease of going through a divorce process because it isn't easy and it can't be easy. It's just not, either way is not easier. There is less conflict by not going through the courts. There's less adversarial role in an adversarial system by not going through the courts and going through mediators and people who care about you rather than their money in winning and losing. That's what's taking place here, and I think they said it very well there. So let's go back to finish here what they uh, uh, have to say. And, and before that, remember, you know, and even whether you liked it or not, arranged marriages with commitment do not end in divorce. So it's, it's, a, it's got a lot more to do than the process of divorce, okay, whether a marriage stays together. And this, and I agree with John Lesh so strongly and Bill Doherty, um, this will not make it easier for a divorce. It will make it less adversarial and, and save people's lives and may even save a marriage. That, and, that, and that's really what they're looking at. And this is the experience that people have been through this over and over again and seen it and watched it. All right, let's continue on. I thought I heard you on the radio say yesterday Minnesota would be the first like westernized society to even sort of take this on. Yes, th this, this, would be, uh, this would be, as far as any, anything we have learned in investigating this, both in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, this, this, is, uh, this would be an innovation uh, that, uh, that would be the first, the first time. 
Uh, Australia uh, allows people for child custody issues to be outside the court. Uh, they can work out their private agreement, but everything else has to be done through the court. So th this would be an, an original. Okay, with that then, um, without a model, uh, do you guys have a projected cost? And secondly, for uh, Representative Lush and Senator Pappas, do you guys have any support in the legislature realistically? Do you think this could pass this session? So Andy, do you want to take the, uh, take the cost issue on first? Uh, Andy Dawkins, former legislator, I've uh, been part of this group for a long time. I was the author of parenting plans back in uh, the 1990s, in fact. Uh, I remember everyone saying the sky was going to fall if we went to parenting plans, and then I became a child support magistrate in Hennepin County, and all those judges that were opposing me when I was trying to get it passed would come up and say, God, it's going to be a great idea, Andy. And I'm on this one, too, the same way. I think that uh, the fiscal cost of this is going to pan out as a savings to the state. There are going to be less divorces in the court system, and there's going to be less need for having uh, judges. I believe that the filing fee... All right. Well, I wish you could hear the rest of the press conference. Eventually, the whole press conference will be on the internet uh, on under uh, youtube.com backslash speechless mn uh, but not right now you're just going to be able to see what's on this show um, so thanks for watching uh, the show and remember if you don't stand up for other people's liberties who's going to stand up for yours and good men don't do nothing god bless have a great week on fire and the wind takes the kite as the firefly brings the light you said to me that you wouldn't leave but now I see that you're